Can hydrogen replace diesel? Our PM signed up to the net zero emissions by 2050 target in Glasgow last November. This commits us to progressively reduce our CO2 emissions across all sectors of the economy. In Australia, emissions from transport have been increasing for the last two decades and they contribute 19% of our total CO2 emissions. On the path to zero, many European governments will ban the sale of hydrocarbon fueled road vehicles between 2030 and 2040, and there are plans to also decarbonise rail. Britain has already committed to phase out diesel powered trains by 2040. Australia will have to take similar actions to meet our international commitments, and this is a big challenge for the rail sector. Many locos in operation like this 81 class are nearly 40 years old, but if you order a new, more efficient diesel replacement today, it'll have a 25 year life at most, and may be banned a lot sooner. An alternative is urgently needed. Electric trains obviously have zero emissions. However, the high cost of electrification can only be justified on routes with high traffic volumes. Rail networks in cities are generally electrified, and so are the major intercity lines in Europe and Japan, with trains running past every few minutes. However, the cost of electrification cannot be justified on branch lines, where there may only be a few trains a day, and these are usually served by diesel multiple units. In Australia, nearly all trains outside the state capital cities are powered by diesel. Battery technology has made great advances in recent years and you can now buy an electric car with a 500 km range. But this is not the case for rail. In Europe, battery electric multiple units like this Bombardier Talent are now entering service. However, axle load and space limit battery capacity and hence range to under 100 km. These may fill short gaps between electrified sections, but for longer distances, Hydrogen seems to be the most promising emission-free solution. Why hydrogen? If the target is zero emissions, hydrogen appears to be the perfect fuel, with water vapour being the only product. Fuel cells have nearly double the efficiency of internal combustion engines. Although at present industrial hydrogen is grey, made by reforming natural gas, there are proposals in all states to produce green hydrogen on a large scale by electrolysis using solar, wind or hydroelectric power. As Australia imports almost all of its diesel fuel, this would be a bonus in terms of energy cell sufficiency. Hydrogen has an energy value of 120 megajoules per kilogram, almost three times that of diesel. It is great for rocket fuel. And its energy density is 300 times that of batteries. However, there are some obstacles. First, there is the volume problem. Because it has such low density, hydrogen must be compressed or liquefied. The red arrow points to the fuel tank under a GD46 locomotive. It is basically a rectangular box which holds 10,000 litres or 10 cubic metres of diesel. The third line in the table gives the volume of hydrogen equivalent in energy. Even as a liquid, the volume is 45 cubic metres. At 35 megapascals, the volume of 136 cubic metres is roughly the size of the whole locomotive above the underframe. By the way, 35 and 70 megapascals are 350 or 700 bar respectively, or 5,000 and 10,000 psi in the old units. Next is the high pressure problem. Recent automotive applications have used compressed gas at 35 or 70 megapascals. These are very high pressures and require specialised vessels, generally made with wound carbon fibre. Even so, these must have thick walls and small diameters. Multiple tanks are required for larger volumes. The locomotive tank in the previous slide is made from steel plate and weighs under 3 tonnes but holds nearly three times its weight in fuel. A tank for compressed hydrogen is much heavier than the fuel. The US Department of Energy sets a target of 6% weight for weight, i.e. a tank weighing 100 kilograms holds only 6 kilograms of hydrogen. 
The Tata Mirai tanks hold 5 kilograms and weigh 88 kilograms. Scaling up for a locomotive, tanks to hold the energy equivalent of 10,000 litres of diesel would weigh around 47 tonnes. Liquid hydrogen is denser, but at a temperature of 20 degrees above absolute zero, or minus 253 C. You can tell the guy in the picture is not decanting liquid H2 into his tank because he's not wearing gloves. But seriously, liquid hydrogen is extremely hazardous and requires special equipment to handle and store it, making it unattractive for rail transport. A liquid hydrogen tank cannot be a rectangular box and needs to be heavily insulated. Even so, gas will continually boil off with a loss of 1-2% to per day. It must be safely vented to atmosphere to prevent pressure rise. Furthermore, there is a big upfront energy penalty as the work required to liquefy hydrogen is about one third of its energy content and it requires a large capital intensive facility. Transporting diesel fuel is relatively simple. It is more difficult with compressed hydrogen. Any railway filling point is likely to be some distance from the source of hydrogen production. While a road tanker may carry over 30,000 litres of diesel, a typical tube trailer for hydrogen compressed to 18 megapascals may weigh 27 tonnes, but carry only 300 kilograms of gas. The energy overhead for distribution by road is therefore not insignificant. Furthermore, every time hydrogen is transferred, it is necessary to recompress the gas, with the work of compression being 5 to 10% of the energy. Energy is consumed with every transfer, from source to road trailer, from trailer to vehicle, or trailer to the reservoir at the filling point. Liquefying eliminates the problem of recompressing at each transfer, but takes a 30% energy hit up front. Although fuel cells are much more efficient than internal combustion engines, the overall cycle efficiency is not much better. The green line in the graph shows fuel cell net percentage efficiency may be in the mid 50s at low power, but decreases as current density increases. A PEM fuel cell may be only 42% efficient at full power. More than half the energy must be rejected as heat, but because the operating temperature is around 70 degrees C, the low temperature differential requires very large radiators and high air flows. In broad terms, the overall efficiency from solar panel to electrolyzer to compressor to tank to fuel cell and finally to traction motor is 30% at best, compared to around 90% for batteries. Yet, in spite of all the difficulties, a lot has been achieved. The Alstom Karate Island is a two-car set based on a DMU and two have been running successfully in service in Lower Saxony since 2018, with more in production and on trial. This is quite impressive. Note that a 335 kilowatt diesel engine is replaced by fuel cells of 200 kilowatt capacity, and batteries provide the peak power. The train operates at up to 140 kilometers per hour, with a range of 6 to 800 kilometers. The equipment takes up most of the roof area. At one end, the fuel cells are mounted with the cooling group, which needs to reject over 200 kilowatts of heat. 24 carbon fiber reinforced vessels with 4,000 litre volume are mounted in the middle section. There are at least a dozen projects in Europe and Asia working on trains conceptually similar to the island. In the UK, the University of Birmingham and Porterbrook converted a Class 319 EMU which ran on the main line in September 2020. This admittedly had the equipment mounted inside the passenger saloons. Several other British operators are working on hydrogen conversions with equipment under the floor. The roof would be preferable to avoid trapping any leaking hydrogen, but bridge and tunnel clearances in Britain do not allow roof mounted equipment. Could hydrogen replace diesel multiple units in Australia? Victoria has the largest DMU fleet, with the velocity trains running between Melbourne and the regional towns. In New South Wales, DMUs serve the Hunter Valley and the Southern Highlands. Two of the longer trips are Melbourne to Albury and Sydney to Canberra, both of which are 320 kilometres, one way. 
A train like the Island could operate these as a return service with refuelling only at one end. The XPT services which connect Sydney to Brisbane and Sydney to Melbourne are each nearly a thousand kilometres. My preliminary simulations indicate that these might be possible with this technology with refuelling at each end. However, these are about the limit. High speed services need continuous high power. The island relies on batteries to provide maximum power with the fuel cells providing a constant average power recharging the batteries. This is okay for the duty cycle of the regional train with many stops, but not for long distances with constant high power. To go even 50% faster would require quadrupling the fuel cells and doubling the fuel. There are several shunting locomotive projects underway in Europe and the USA. Again, batteries provide peak power with the fuel cells charging the battery in between. However, a mainline locomotive must be capable of providing maximum power for hours at a time, like when climbing long grades. The fuel cells to provide, say, 3000 kilowatts of continuous power could easily fit into a locomotive and would be less than half the weight of the engine and generator. However, the challenge is how to store the fuel, as the following examples will show. The first case study is Hunter Valley Coal Service. Three locomotives on a train running from the furthest mine at Ulan each use around 4,500 litres on a round trip, and so can make two trips on a 10,000 litre tank. If one round trip is considered as a minimum requirement, the energy equivalent of 5,000 litres would be needed or 1150 kilograms of hydrogen. Remember that figure. For compressed gas at 35 megapascals, the volume required is 50 cubic meters. This could be carried in 36 400 millimeter diameter carbon fiber tanks on a 20 meter flat wagon, which if you use your imagination would look something like this. With one wagon for each locomotive, you lose four coal wagons as the train length is fixed. Another consideration is supply of hydrogen to the fill point. The Port of Newcastle sees around 60 coal trains per day, which require more than 500 tube trailers per day, so road transport becomes somewhat impracticable. A pipeline from the source would probably be necessary. If the 1150 kilograms was liquid hydrogen, the volume would be 16,000 litres, but it would still be hard to fit on a locomotive as it would not be a rectangular box, but a pressure vessel with thick insulation. However, a single tanker wagon 20 metres long could hold seven tonnes, more than enough fuel for three locomotives for two days. However, an additional complication is that due to the problems of such low temperatures, it would not be desirable to transfer liquid hydrogen and hoses from the wagon through the locomotives. Instead, the liquid hydrogen must be vaporised before transferring it. In North America, where LNG is used in some operations, hot water is transferred from the locomotive to the tanker for this purpose. Intermodal services would require bigger tanks than coal service. For example, running from Melbourne to Brisbane requires around 12,000 litres per locomotive. 2,760 kilograms of hydrogen would be the equivalent energy and one liquid hydrogen tanker would be sufficient for two locomotives. Compressed gas would require two fuel wagons per locomotive, which begins to become a bit impracticable. Furthermore, no locomotive can perform the trip from Adelaide to Perth without refuelling, and a diesel tanker wagon with inline refuelling is often used to provide additional capacity, as on the SCT train in the picture. About four liquid hydrogen tankers would be needed to provide the equivalent energy. It would be great if there's a way to squeeze more hydrogen into a tank. And although it seems very counterintuitive, one way is to fill the tank with metal first. Hydride storage pushes hydrogen atoms between the atoms in a metal lattice, offering a volume density nearly double that of liquid hydrogen. High pressures and temperatures are generally required, but more moderate pressures and temperatures have been demonstrated in work at the University of New South Wales. This method has significant safety advantages as well. The 1150 kilograms above could be stored in a volume of 8,700 litres. 
This volume is more in keeping with the size of an existing locomotive fuel tank, although it would still need to be in tubes pressurised to around 10 MPa, occupying more space than a rectangular box. However, at 57 tonnes, the weight of hydride is almost half that of the typical locomotive. There is a trade-off between volume and weight. Ammonia is a compound of hydrogen and nitrogen, i.e. NH3. While generally made from methane using the Haber-Bosch process, it can be made from air and hydrogen from renewables. Ammonia can be used directly as a carbon-free fuel or as a means to store and transport hydrogen. While a gas at ambient temperature, it can be liquefied at minus 33 degrees C using conventional refrigeration equipment. Liquid ammonia stores hydrogen more densely than liquid hydrogen, 122 versus 72 kilograms per cubic metre. Ammonia may become the chief means of transporting bulk hydrogen, as it is also much easier to handle than liquid hydrogen, and the energy required to produce ammonia and then crack it to recover the hydrogen is similar to that required to liquefy hydrogen. The CSIRO has demonstrated technology to crack ammonia to provide hydrogen at an automotive filling station. If this could be adapted to fit on board a locomotive, it would allow the use of fuel cells with hydrogen carried as ammonia, requiring much less volume than compressed gas or liquid hydrogen. Alternatively, ammonia can be used directly as a fuel for an IC engine. However, ammonia has very poor autoignitability, and most trials have used diesel as a pilot fuel. Nevertheless, MAN has already developed a ship engine which runs purely on ammonia. The high pressures and temperatures required for ignition result in significant NOx emissions, which require catalytic aftertreatment, increasing the complexity in the requirement for space. Lower temperatures reduce NOx, but incomplete combustion leads to ammonia in the exhaust, which is toxic. Ammonia has around 43% the energy content of diesel. Considering the Hunter Valley coal locomotive case, 14,600 litres of liquid ammonia would give energy equivalent to 5,000 litres of diesel. Again, this could not be in a rectangular box, but the requirements would be much simpler than for hydrogen. A tanker of the sort currently used to transport LPG could be used, easily providing fuel for three locomotives. Besides technical viability, cost must be also considered. Currently, hydrogen costs $12 to $25 delivered, and this is grey hydrogen made from methane. Its production produces 6 kilograms of CO2 for every kilogram of hydrogen, so it is not exactly saving the planet. Green hydrogen made from renewables is more expensive, but it is assumed that in the future it will become cheap and abundant. However, there is a serious risk that road transport may decarbonise more quickly and more cheaply. Elon Musk has been promising a battery-powered semi since 2017. If he succeeds in producing a vehicle that can haul a reasonable payload for 800 kilometres without recharging, it will be a huge threat to intermodal rail. Rail could no longer claim to be the low emission mode of transport. So in conclusion, can hydrogen replace diesel? A technical solution using compressed hydrogen already exists to replace DMUs for regional passenger services. It will be a challenge to extend this for longer distance, higher speed passenger services. Freight trains will probably require tanker wagons, but neither compressed gas nor liquid hydrogen are easy solutions. Ammonia or hydride storage may be the way forward. We can expect for the next decade there'll be many trials and experiments, and no doubt progress will be made in overcoming some of the difficulties. However, all is contingent on abundant and cheap hydrogen being produced from renewables. Can hydrogen replace diesel? Maybe.